every people chooses at some point in their history how they'll be governed, whether it be through revolution, a bloody revolution or a peaceful revolution, whether it's abrupt or emerges over time, people recognize this is who I am, this is who I want to be, this is who I'm willing to fight for and die for, and that leads to sovereignty. Sovereignty. Those who possess it have a responsibility to wield it fairly and justifiably. Others who recognize it must respect its inherent value towards better relationships and collaborations between themselves and those sovereign. To Native Americans, sovereignty is more than just a simple definition that can be found in any dictionary. It's an actual state of being that encompasses its people with earned pride, earned self-reliance, and earned responsibility. Over the course of the next few minutes, we will explore the core of sovereignty, what it means to the Indian people, the laws that govern it, and how it affects the bordering cities as well as the counties that have reservations within them. Sovereignty, as understood by the United States in relationship to the tribes, is predicated to a great degree on this document called the Doctrine of Discovery. It's a legal fiction. In other words, it's made up. But people decided to accept it as a truism, even though, again, I like to stress the fact it is made up. But the Doctrine of Discovery simply said that Europeans had a superior title to the New World based on discovery, and that the right of the natives to their own lands in the New World was simple occupancy. They could say that. First hundred years, the Indians didn't even know that they were saying that because the tribes were powerful. They were able to resist and fight back against the Europeans. But time progresses, uh, we have disease, we have warfare, and the tribes are now in a position where they need to negotiate with the United States. And the United States accepts England's doctrine of discovery rights. And the tribes were still powerful enough that the United States, even though they believed they had title to the land, continued to negotiate with the tribes. Cultures evolve, governments evolve, but sovereignty as practiced historically and in the United States is the right to govern yourself. And this is what the relationship with the tribes of the United States has taught them, that you don't stop governing. No matter how much they may want to limit your governance, you never stop governing because you're unique politically, socially, culturally, and you're proud of that uniqueness and differentness. We control our destiny through sovereignty. That's why sovereignty is paramount as far as protecting it. Sovereignty is our existence. Without sovereignty, our culture, our religion, and tradition is under attack. So the tribes must maintain culture, tradition, religion, and sovereignty to be an existing survivable band or tribe. During the American period, uh, Americans came here to settle uh, California, and when they, they saw Indians as an Indian problem and they wanted to remove us, they, they wanted to put us off on reserves, which the Americans called reservations, which would segregate us from the, from the rest of the population. So they came up with the, the Treaty of Santa Isabel of 1852, which they got a small group of Indians, and they signed the Treaty of Santa Isabel, and it got sent off to Washington, which, and uh, put, off it, put in a drawer somewhere and, and locked up and never got ratified. The Santa Isabel Treaty of 1852 recognized the attending tribes as an assimilated group and as such, granted them permanent territories. By the sheer act of initializing, proposing, and the actual signing of the treaty, the United States government committed itself to the acceptance that these tribal groups were, in fact, a sovereign entity. After the Treaty of Santa Isabel 1852 didn't get ratified, the United States government tried using uh, termination and assimilation to try to deal with the Indian problem. Um, this didn't seem to work because Indian people retain their culture, retain their language, and retain their, uh, their, their ties to the land. And we've gotten strong, and now instead of dealing with a government to conquer nation, 
relationship. We're dealing with the government as a government-to-government -government relationship. And now we're allowed to govern ourselves, but it doesn't seem that we're allowed to police ourselves. You look at history and you see the literally hundreds of treaties. You look at the thousands of pages of congressional acts. You look at the Supreme Court, no longer just interpreting the validity of the Constitution, but interpreting the political environment and how they want the Constitution to be read, clearly points out that other than snippets of time where people of moral integrity stand up, the push is to take away from the tribes. Push, push, push. So we can never let our guard down. If we do, we may turn around and discover we've lost more of our right to govern ourselves. Historically, the relationship between the U.S. government on both the federal and state levels and sovereign tribes have been less than hopeful. But in an attempt to further the relationship with sovereign people, the U.S. government enacted Public Law 280. With good intentions, PL 280 separates criminal regulatory law from civil regulatory laws within the reservations, thus giving sovereign tribes the power to oversee their own civil regulatory laws. Although a step in the right direction, PL 280 also added confusion to an already complex myriad of jurisdiction that defined tribal governments toward the end of the 20th century. You look up here to the hills, you see the foothills in the valley, you don't see the tribe's sovereign land. You don't see our sovereign air shed, the airspace up there our mountain, all that, you don't see those things because you're not taught them. So Public Law 280, I think, put over a veneer of, of, of opaque blindness for its society, where you kind of see cloudiness when you look at a tribe's sovereignty. But the best I can tell you is that the civil criminal jurisdiction thing was never worked out properly and to this day. We have concurrent jurisdiction, which means that the state and county can't run amok without including the tribes now. That happened with the amendment. Prior to that, there was no involvement of the tribes. Constantly, since the termination and Public Law 280 were activated in the uh, 1953, there's been a misconception that the state of California, in a lot of cases, various counties within the state of California have jurisdiction over tribes, which is, is not true. It takes us to continually educate the outside governments as to our authority. We are not political subdivisions of the state. I think every uh, tribal council member needs to understand that and continually repeat that fact. We are independent governments with, located within the state. The purpose of Public Law 280 was to take care of problems that were real on the reservations. And very simply, it says on the surface, if you read it, you know, quickly that states have the right to exercise criminal jurisdiction over the tribes, federal laws out of the picture, uh, civil regulation is hazy and vague, and that um, the tribes can still maintain their tribal governments, uh, maintain their tribal lands, and govern themselves internally, but Definitely, if there's issues in reference to criminal activity in particular, that the state would step in. But if you go back and read the law more carefully, this Public Law 280, the tribes did not actually lose the right to govern themselves. It's just that the lawyer's interpretation of it made it seem like they did. Tribes maintained the right to have criminal jurisdiction. Uh, they have to share it with the state, however and civil jurisdiction, they have pretty much the right to govern themselves in that area. And regulatory jurisdiction, they pretty much have the ability to do whatever they need. Whether it be something as simple as doing a dog licensing ordinance or something as complex as running a casino, but regulatory jurisdiction. Then not too soon after that, we move into consultation, which was a, again, another shot in the arm that allows tribes to uh, publicly express to the government of the United States their real concerns, their real issues, and sometimes maybe even a way to resolve those concerns and issues with the federal government. And consultation has given opportunities to the tribes that did not exist before. I think in the past, um, what we saw before uh, was 
tribes really using sovereignty and holding on to it, and it, rightfully so, as it's, as it's put forth in the Constitution, tribes do have that uh, sovereign right for economics and, and, uh, and political sovereignty. Uh, but, you know, some tribes in the past and, and probably in the, in, in the current day hold that sovereignty and say, you know, we're sovereign entities and, you know, so because we're sovereign we can do what we want and we can make up our own rules and you have to just deal with it. And I think that that might be a little bit, uh, might be an improper way of going about things moving forward. I think that tribes need to foster a cooperative government-to-government -government relationship and, and where all sides respect the sovereignty of each other. Uh, at the state, local, tribal, federal level. Um, we are all entities trying to get the job done uh, for our people moving forward, not just at the tribal level, but the local, state, and federal level. Everybody needs to work together because we're all in this together for the service of our people. Um, it doesn't matter what level you're elected at. We're, we're uh, charged with the responsibility of taking care of our constituency, and I think that you know, using sovereignty as just the, the, the basis and the foundation of saying, hey, let's come together as sovereign entities and take care of our people and, and find the best way to move forward, I think is something that we all need to capitalize on. Clearly, as an established, respected, sovereign people, recognition is deserved, but not just for the purpose of pride, but mainly for civic and social issues that pertain to in and around the Indian community and its neighbors. If we are able to recognize each other as equals and share a mutual respect, then we can close the gap between what needs to be done and what is being done. This is all to the benefit of everyone, Indians and non-Indians, living in the proximate region. Understanding each other and each other's needs is paramount. However, without proper representation, issues cannot be heard and mitigation impossible. Without proper representation, we will never realize the positive collaboration between the communities to solve issues that pertain to both. Although the Santa Isabel Sovereignty Treaty was signed over 150 years ago, a disconnected relationship between state, federal, and tribal governments still exists today. It is imperative that this correlation gap must be minimized by Indians and non-Indian governments working together for the betterment of all peoples. Indians are a social asset. They engage in civil prosperity and are an economic benefit to surrounding communities. As such, Native Americans proudly embrace their heritage and culture. And at the center of their honorable way of life is an enduring core belief in their given right. Of sovereignty. It's extremely important that people understand that sovereignty comes from within the people. Uh, it's been said before my time and I've heard it you know growing up uh, from various people but you know sovereignty to me is borders language and culture. To our death we will have sovereignty over our people. It's the right to govern our own. It's a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. It's a government-to-government -government relationship. Without our sovereign authority and jurisdiction within our own reservations, our culture, our tradition, and our religion could die. Sovereignty means to me that we can practice our culture and our religion and our language as we see fit, and no other government can take that away from us.